So this is hot off the press. We just saw this, um, ran over this with Bass Lace and Associates, the firm that um, completed the survey on behalf of the school district. So bear with me, I'm hopefully <laughs> we'll catch every detail for you. Um, but this is um, some really information, really good information for you all to frame your discussions this evening as you start to make some final deci decisions on what moves forward in, as part of your recommendation. We want you to understand, have this context of what your community at large is um, thinking and would be supporting. So this is a um, was completed by a, th a third party opinion research firm, Bass Lease and Associates. They um, are what best in the business, um, one of the most um, well respected and well, uh, most used with public work in the state of Texas. And we've worked with them um, on countless um, bond proposals throughout the state. This is a live telephone survey completed with registered voters in your community. Um, so they are on the phone for about 11 minutes and it doesn't count towards these results unless they complete that survey from start to finish. Um, so you'll see here, it was completed with 200 respondents with a margin of error of 6.9%. So the objectives of the survey, we wanna assess general attitudes about Little Elm ISD understand just general opinions, attitudes of where voters are um, about the school district, assess current levels of support and opposition to a $150 million bond proposal. That number is um, something that we ha had to put forth and we looked at different um, numbers and capacity. You'll see that, that broken down here in a little bit. Um, but we chose $150 million to use in what we call the ballot um, to see at the beginning of the survey if their support and then educate them to see um, if where we're able to move voters in support of a $150 million bond proposal. And then lastly, to measure the correlation of informative statements on support or opposition of a bond proposal. The word current is underlined because we just want to remind you that this is a snapshot in time. This is really what, um, where we're at with voters today. Now, when we get out and an election is officially called, we're putting voter materials out. If there's opposing messages and whatnot, we want to. Um, this helps inform those messages we need to put out to voters. But remember, this is a snapshot in time. So the format of the questionnaire it starts with some introduction and screeners. We want to make sure they're a registered voter in your community. General and specific issues, the opinions of the school district. And then the initial ballot. Basically, we want to know how, vote, how voters would vote in support of a bond without, at the very beginning without um, informing them much about a potential bond proposal. And we'll look at that question. And then through the survey, we are essentially educating the respondent, um, measuring the impact of specific information that we're providing them on the potential bond program itself. At the end of the survey, we ask again, now knowing more about it, what we call an informed ballot, now that they know more that they would receive for that $150 million, how to support line then. Then they then use um, regression analysis to measure what specific information was most relevant in, in, in that informed ballot and in switching people in favor of the bond proposal or solidifying them in support of the bond proposal. And then lastly, we um, wrap up with demographics just to make sure we're getting a representative sample of your community. A really critical part of the, your demographics is obviously looking at age. This helps break down the um, sample file that the actual respondents compared to what you would see in other elections in the turnout. So, the first line up here is um, what you, the actual breakdown of registered voters in Little Elm ISD today. So 47% of your voters are 18 to 44 with 19% um, 65 and over. What you see is that depending on the type of election and the high, per, high to low turnout you see in those types of elections, the age um, becomes older. You have lower percentage turnout in your younger voters, your 18 to 44, 
and obviously higher percentage makeup of your older voters in those low turnout elections. So November 2012 would have been the presidential election. November 2015 is a essentially similar to what we would see this November. It just had, um, I think, believe constitutional amendments, maybe anything local you would have had at that time. So the survey itself had 38% of 18 to 44 year olds. Um, so it really resembled somewhere between your registration and what you would see in a high turnout election. So we want to pay attention to that when we look at the numbers and remember that um, it's important that we, one, educate our older voters and to work to really turn out our younger voters. So name awareness levels. We want, this was the general, um, and specific information at the beginning about the school district itself. We asked the respondent if they know of Little Elm Independent School District, and if so, if they have a positive or negative opinion. So of the dis district itself, 82% of respondents said they have a positive opinion of the school district compared to 12% negative. Um, what we like to look at is this, the positive to negative ratio. This is obviously a really good percentage. Um, even higher with your parents, 87% have a positive image of the school district with 73% of non-parents having a positive image, which is again really good. Board of Trustees, 43% have a positive image with 9% negative. Typical to have about half of your voters, um, of the respondents that just don't have an opinion or You've never heard of them because they're not surprising as engaged as everyone. So again, really good positive to negative ratio there. Um, and trended the same with parents and both non-parents. So then we asked about Dr. Shrike. It's important that. I'll give you those 5%. <laughs> the respondent, the results are anonymous. You can't find out who those five people are, unfortunately. I was, I was wondering more about the 39s. I was say, I never heard of the 39s. Never heard of? Leave them alone. <laughs> yeah. So what's, well, obviously we want to just gauge how opinions of leadership. So we threw out the superintendent's name. Uh, the highest positive to negative ratio out of all three, I will say. <laughs> Um, this is this is really typical. We see this everywhere, um, and again, we were just wanting to, to see that positive to negative. Um, and you you'll see that obviously um, parents are going to be way more apt to know the superintendent by name um, and have a 49% to 6% positive, um, and non-parents 21%. Another question we asked at the beginning was their um, perception about how the district manages money. So which best describes your opinion of how Little Elm manages the money it has to operate the school district? 27% said they think they do, they operate wisely and effectively, while 39% say as well as can be expected, 14% wastefully and ineffectively, and 20% unsure. So interesting here, um, well we always say that you want to have about twice as much wisely and effectively to wastefully and ineffectively, which you do have here, um, which is positive. Um, a, a good amount of unsure. Again, the positive to negative here is really good. And there's an opportunity to educate people on how you operate the school district. We did dig in and wanted to show you how that breaks down parents to non-parents. And another way to look at it is under 55 and 55 and over. So we were talking about this today, and so you could technically be um, 55 and over, and a parent, there is some overlap. So just two ways to look at it, but non-parents and 55 and over are trending um, to, be, to have more of a perception that you um, manage it wastefully, so. <coughs> we also wanted to understand the perception of growth in your community. So we asked, if, do you think Little Elm ISD has enough schools and classrooms to meet the needs of the district over the next five or ten years? So half, when you see the version X and Y, that just means half the time the respondent heard 
five years and the other half of respondent heard 10 years. We just like to sometimes mix that up to see if there's a, it makes a difference of when you're, um, how you're referring to the, wording the question. So 10% say you have enough. <laughs> 18% say unsure, and 72% says you need more. So this is great news that people understand, they get that growth is coming, and that hopefully you need to do something to address it. Um, we've asked this question in, in a lot of districts, and this is probably one of the highest I've ever seen it. Um, and what's really positive about this is, the different, is that even your um, non-parents in 55 and over, at least um, half of them think you need more. And another third are unsure. So that's just opportunity, to, again, to educate those non-parents that, again, may not be as engaged. They just don't know. Um, if your schools are full, you, it's an opportunity to inform them on that, on that. OK. So the initial ballot. This, is, this wording is purposely written very similar to how you would see it if you were to go in and, and cast your vote um, for or against a bond election so that um, we're not giving them much information. This is, again, what you would see when you go to vote. We want to um, understand right out of the gate where support lies. So if an election were held today, would you vote for or against the issuance of $150 million in bonds for constructing, renovating, and equipping schools with the living of a property tax thereof? So we start out with 58% of respondents saying, they, yes, they would vote for it. 23% somewhat and 35% strongly. 16% depends or unsure. And 26% against with 19% strongly. So right out of the gate, this is a really, really good starting point. I'll tell you, a lot of times we may have plurality, but we usually don't have majority, and that's because you haven't told them anything yet, right? Why should I support this yet? But we do want to dig into the intensity of um, support. And the reason we look at that is because these are going to be the um, intensity tells you more of the people that are going to actually get out and vote for it. Um, if you're somewhat for something or somewhat opposed, you may not be as motivated to go to the polls. So we want to um, dig in and look at those two, and you, you have 35% um, strongly for it, 19% strongly against. Again, when we look, break down, and look at parents versus non-parents, um, your parents have 42% strongly for, total 68% for, and your non-parents, you actually um, are more against us in the beginning. So they have are strongly against with split right down the middle with 42-42 um, for and against. Same when you look at the age breakdown. Again, it's going to trend really similar to parents and non-parents. So remember I said when we looked at the age of our survey and how it matched registration versus what we would probably um, project to see in a low turnout election like this November, we, what they did was adjust those numbers to take into account the age um, breakdown of those lower turnout elections. And what that extrapolates to is 30% is um, strongly for versus 24% strongly against, which just tells us it's a, probably a closer race than um, and what we'd expect is really could go either way at this point without having had the opportunity to inform the responding yet. So then we asked them to tell us in their own words why they um, would vote against if they were one that said they would vote opposed. 39% said taxes. It's always the leading reason. <laughs> Not surprising. 32% said they just need more information, details. Well, that's not surprising, and that's a really positive thing to have that high percentage of your no votes saying that. That's opportunity right there, right? Those are people we can engage and educate. 9% um, had some form of a district criticism, and 14% just said not needed. Again, you could work on these not needed possibly and make sure they understand the needs. Um, but again, this just kind of helps us 
gauge um, why people would, at this point, be against it. So next, we wanted to dig into the dollar amount of the bond proposal a little bit more and read them three different amounts, but this time with the corresponding tax impact. So it's one thing to vote for $150 million, but it's another thing to understand how that affects my bottom line as a resident of the community. So we tested first um, $125 million, which would increase property taxes by approximately $15 per month for the average home value of $250,000. So 56% said they would vote for, 36% said they would ag vote against. Um, so we're still uh, up, but you can see just even from the slide before how we um, have gone down. Another thing, if you remember before, parents were right down the middle, or non-parents were right down the middle on that initial ballot. We're now at a net negative 18 for um, 125 for that um, particular tax impact. So then we asked, would you vote for $150 million? So just to let you know now, half the time respondents heard it from top to bottom, the other half the respondents heard it bottom to top, and so these results average that together. Because obviously if you say 125, yeah, that sounds good, 150, nah, and you keep going higher, you're going to obviously be, be more apt to not support the higher dollar amount versus if you hear the 175, which is the last amount last. So 150 would increase taxes approximately $18. Dollars and seventy-five cents per month for the average home value of two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Fifty-one percent said they would vote for it, with now down to twenty-five percent strongly for. So you can see here is where we kind of break even with our intensity of support and opposition. One hundred seventy-five million increasing property taxes by approximately twenty-four dollars and thirty-seven cents per month for the average home value. Um, this is where we even start to lose parents. Um, so you can see only 14% strongly for and 34% strongly against. Um, what I will say is that when we developed these numbers, we were, had to make certain assumptions in the bonding capacity and the associated tax rate. And so Grant is going to speak to the, um, the amounts in a little bit and how that it has fluctuated since then. So we think you can get more than 150 for that associated increase. So for question nine, 125 million, this calculation was assuming six cents. I wrote it down. I believe it was six cents, 10 cents, and then 13 cents. So we'll talk more about that. This gives you a good, a good baseline. So then following the initial ballot and then talking about associated tax impact, we run the respondent a series of potential bond elements. So the, this was the first section that was grouped together. And basically the question was, does this, when they were read the element, does this element make you favor, strongly favor, oppose, strongly oppose, the potential bond. So the first section is regarding the elementary level growth. So we first read to the respondent, several of the district's elementary school, schools are over functional capacity and more growth is expected. Please tell me if you favor or oppose each of the following two options. Con first, constructing a new elementary school or classroom additions to existing elementary schools to accommodate growth, so we split sampled that one. And then, so 78% favored that with a net impact of plus 63. Question 13, repurposing Powell Sixth Grade Center and Presswick K-8 STEM Academy to come elementary schools. Um, and this messaging, I think, was important to save the district from having to build new schools and have sixth through eighth all at the same level. So on the surface, um, building new or adding classroom additions, um, you have, I think this breaks it down, um, 
obviously more favor for. So there was no statistical difference, just to note for you the difference between talking about a new elementary school versus classroom additions. Um, both of those pretty much equally supported. Definitely support for both. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about Powell and Prestwick. So this was really driven by parents that we found that 69% of non-parents actually favored this element, where 52% of parents opposed it. Um, so we thought that was interesting. We had a lot of discussion about this element. Um, I think probably a little surprised by that. It, and what I think that tells us is that we really need to be intentionable, intentionable, ugh, I can't, um, too much words, um, with how we communicate this element. And, I think that talking about saving tax dollars was really appealing to the non-parents, right? That's how we chose to message that in this um, survey. Um, but I think that we'll, we need to dig into that more and understand possibly what, if we move forward with that project, how it needs to be communicated to parents. OK, now Lakeside. We're, gonna, this, we're kinda jumping the gun with some things you're gonna hear from Paul in a little bit, but we spent some time looking at Lakeside and as we've developed costs for um, several options on renovating Lakeside and adding on to Lakeside, we said, at what point does it make sense to just build a new Lakeside? So we wanted to test that as part of the survey. So we first read to the respondent, Lakeside Middle School could enroll more than 1,400 students by 2018, putting it well over its functional capacity. This bond would allow for the construction of a new middle school to serve the district's growing middle school population. 82%. Overwhelmingly, we need a new middle school. I think everybody um, is on board with that. So then we talked about what to do with Lakeside. Lakeside Middle School is 37 years old, was last renovated 22 years ago, is in, in need of repair. Please tell me if you favor oppose each of the following two options. Making significant renovations to Lakeside to bring it up, up to today's standards and make it equitable to the new middle school. 79% favor this element. Question 16, completely rebuilding Lakeside Middle School. Half the time respondents heard which only costs a little more than it would to renovate it, to bring it up to today's standards and make it equitable to the new middle school. 68% said they were in favor of this element. So again, on the surface, um, renovating was actually more appealing to the respondents than building new. When we tested the elements separately and wanted to gauge their favorability separately, so what we did do is to dig into this a little bit further, asked a preference question separately. Oh, and there was surprisingly no difference when you said it would only cost a little bit more. So then we asked, OK, but if you had a choice and we wanted to inform you a little bit more, renovating like Lakeside would extend the life of the school 20 years and would cost less than completely rebuilding the school, but not much less. Rebuilding the school would extend the life of the school by at least 50 years and would cost more than renovations, but not much more. Hearing this, which of the following do you prefer? 29% said renovating it, 60% said rebuilding it, 2% neither, 8% sure. So again, it's all in how you message something. And it, on the surface, there, I think there's still both viable options to the respondent. You're, they're both supported. Um, but when we were able to dig into this and give them the choice, they um, preferred rebuilding it. And then 68% of parents said to rebuild. Um, and even our non-parents preferred the rebuild. OK, I'm going to pull this up. So after that section about both the elementary and middle school growth, we then got into the other potential bond elements. And these were all read at random. So you know, ne the respondent was never receiving these in the same order. 
So we talked about basically anything and everything that's been discussed in this room so far. Um, one thing I'll just go ahead and note is really the positive response across the board for everything we tested. Um, with really high net favors, there's a few down here that we'll talk about, but I'll run through these really quick. So question 17 is really more of a general statement about growth. We just wanted to see and we educated the respondent on the projections that you're seeing, 900 students in five years and 1,500 in the next 10 years, um, what the support was there, so a net, favor, net impact of plus 60. Question 18, this bond would allow for upgrades and repairs to aging school buildings, such as new air conditioning and roofing, to extend the life of the school or to make school buildings operate more efficiently. That was really high with net um, 75%. Question 19 is um, talking about the STEM improvements at the elementary level. Um, this bond would include minor renovations to elementary schools to create multi-purpose areas for students to collaborate in small groups and conduct experiments. Again, positive. Question 20 um, is testing the multi-purpose facility. So it would include construction of a multi-purpose facility used by a variety of several extracurricular activities, including athletics, band, dance, and cheer. Um, growing student programs have outgrown current spaces and need additional room for training, as well as safe place during inclement weather. So I've tested this in a lot of communities, and surprise, it did test so well. Um, but I, I've learned how the messaging really does make a difference on, um, on this element. So question 21, CTE program. Um, improvements. So CTE allows students to prepare for college and the workforce. The bond um, could enhance these programs, including health science, ag, engineering, by improving and expanding existing program spaces. Really high percent with 83% favor and net 71. 22, this bond could include improvements to current technology, infrastructure, and devices on all campuses, provide better instructional tools and learning opportunities. 23, Improvements to aging athletic facilities in need of repair um, and upgrades including track resurfacing, bleacher replacement, locker room renovations. Um, not surprising, you're talking about athletics to see it go down a little bit, but still really good percent favor. Question 24, talking about safety and security improvements, um, including additional security cameras and access control systems. Question 25 is um, just informing them on the state um, freeze on tax home, tax, <sighs> taxpayers, homeowners 65 years of age or older. So um, basically their school taxes only um, are set at that, um, the actual rate the, that they pay, not, or not the rate, but the amount that they pay. Um, not surprising, a very positive element. Question 26 is informing them about you guys. A diverse advisory committee has been working to evaluate the district's needs and will include recommendations from this group. It's always important to educate them on that. And then question 27 is a, um, actually what we call a negative element. We want to, one, put that out there, just kind of keep the respondent on their toes. Um, and then we want to see how that, um, moves people in favor, support, how they, when they're hearing all these positive things, if they hear a negative thing, like they potentially would when you move forward in educating voters, um, how that moves. So you do see that support goes down. Only 39% favor the bond with that. So some of the split samples. Version X. So talking about extending life of school buildings was more favorable than talking about more efficient operating. And then this was important to note down here um, that negative statements out there will impact ultimate um, favorability of the bond. OK, so then the informed ballot, after hearing all about that, they've stuck with us now, 11 minutes on the phone. Um, it's all about this question. So now having heard more about it, if an election were held today, would you vote for or against the $150 million in bonds? 
Yay, skyrockets. <laughs> um, so now we've moved the needle. 71% said they would vote for it, with 41% strongly in favor. Um, those depends and unsure, that was up, I think, we can go back and look, but it was much higher. Um, they've solidified their choice. And then 26% said they would um, vote against with Still 19% strongly. You're never going to please everyone. And there's some people that, no matter what you tell them, are going to stay um, against the bond. So remember, we looked at these subgroups before non-parents. Remember, we were 42-42. We even were able to move our non-parents in favor of the bond proposal, which is really great. I've had some where you just can't get that subgroup over. We were able to educate them and get them in favor. Um, Though it's, it's definitely still a challenge with your, your older voters, 32% still strongly against at the end of the survey. So when we adjust that for low turnout, we're now 35% um, strongly for and 23% um, strongly against. So a little bit more of a gap, but I'd say it's still going to take a lot of work. Um, it's in noting the critical things of of the, um, the parent turnout again and educating those older voters. So going back to where we started, just comparing the two to kind of refresh our memories. Um, we were at 58% for at the beginning of the survey, 71% at the end. So what does that tell us? 54% of respondents stayed in favor. 17% switched for, so they were against at the beginning and switched for at the end. 3% stayed, um, depends on sure. 7% switched against. Now you don't know what it was, maybe it was just that um, tax. <laughs> it was 11 minutes, it was that one negative, um, one negative element, it was a tax impact, I don't know. Um, and 19% stayed against. Again, there's going to, in most communities, you almost see closer to a, a quarter that you just aren't going to, to move. So I won't get into too much of this because this is the methodology they use, and I am not the survey expert that does this for a living. But essentially, what they do is then look at each element and um, on the surface, if you remember, so for example, question 18, 61% said they were strongly for this, 26% somewhat favor. So that's what, 87% um, for the bond, or for this element. But we, that we didn't have 87% say they were for it. So what we would do is then dig in to help us understand where these voters ended up at the end of the survey. If 87% said they liked this element, that doesn't mean they um, are going to vote for it. So uh, two, two of them stayed in favor. One switched against, um, one, or I'm sorry, switched for, one switched against, and three stayed against with a net favor of 75%. Compared to question 17, this has a lower net favor, but when we go back and look at where the, these people ended up at the end of the survey, four of them stayed for, two of them switched for, one um, switched against. So they use their Regression analysis, because basically you can do two things. You can solidify someone f in favor of it, or you can switch them in favor of it to assign what they call a correlation score to each element. These are relative scores. Doesn't mean anything on any type of scale until you compare them to the scores of the other elements in the survey. So question 18 received a correlation score of 4.1. <coughs> Question 17, which has 15% net favor below question 18, actually has a correlation score of 16.8. So question 17 is four times 
more persuasive to a respondent to switching or staying in favor of the bond. And this just helps us break it down a little bit more to understand what was it really that voters heard that they liked, and what is it really that voters um, we will want to communicate when um, it comes time to call the bond. So this is a matrix of all those scores. I know you can't read all of that, but we have here basically different subgroups, and the blue highlights the top three elements within those subgroups. So for our total sample, 16.8, and you would only compare again within their sample those scores. So 16.8 was the highest correlation score for the total sample, which was the general element talking about growth projections. The 900 students in five years and 15 more, 100 more students in 10 years was the most persuasive element to the entire sample. The second one was talking more specifically about a new middle school. And the third was talking about technology infrastructure and devices. When we look at parents now, so this is parents, non-parents, voters that vote in all or most elections, vote in some or none, 18 to 54, and 54 plus. So parents are driven, again, they make up a large um, portion of our total sample, are driving our total sample and have the same top three elements, though you, if you notice, this becomes number one, the new middle school. Number two becomes the general growth, and number three is technology. Non-parents, they really liked the Prestwick and Powell element, even though our non-parents didn't, our parents did not. Um, but their talk was talking about CTE. The second one was the STEM and improvements at the elementary campuses. So interesting, our non-parents were really driven by kind of those special programs of hands-on learning and stuff. So he's highlighting the three non-parents. Um, and then, so across the board, age groups was important to know, like, it doesn't matter your age, you were, um, you liked the growth element was important. So this, just, just in one page, kind of summarizes all of that. They call it a message matrix and a quick summary. What are the most important things you can say to um, educate a voter on the potential bond program? So again, the total sample is talking about growth, the new middle school, and technology. Parents were the same, but the middle school was um, slightly correlated more with them. And then non-parent CTE, STEM, um, or I'm sorry, the Powell and Presswick, and then the um, STEM at the elementary schools. So those are the same throughout. Those are the same, and those are the same. So in conclusion, the district has really positive marks from respondents, 82% um, positive to 12% negative image rating. Voters under 55 are more likely to say the district manages its money wisely, while voters um, 55 and older are more likely to say the district manages its money wastefully. Just good to remember that, and um, again, opportunity for education there. On the initial ballot, Remember, we asked them at the very beginning, would they vote for against a $150 million bond proposal? 58% would vote for, while 26% would vote against. Um, that's 16% undecided. Intensity, again, remember, we wanted to look at the ones that said they were strongly for versus strongly against. Um, among older voters and non-parents indicate a close outcome if election were held today and a low turnout election. Majority of voters, both parents and non-parents, are opposed to that 175 with that corresponding tax impact. Parents are opposed to repurposing Powell, and there was no statistical difference when talking about a new elementary expanding them, um, while there's initial support for renovating Lakeside. When we dug in more into that, they preferred rebuilding it. Um, and then after hearing more, we were able to move the needle to 71% saying they would vote for it. 
Um, majority of both parents and non-parents at the end of the survey, that's a big one, um, are, in favor of, are in favor of the bond. And then obviously regression analysis just gave us that wonderful message matrix we just looked at. So that's it. <laughs>